Well, there is no last time since uh, we're starting a new section. I thought I would just do some fun, fun with modular forms. Modular forms. So, uh, I mean, you've seen modular forms before. Okay, good. Some of you have, but I'm not expecting that you that you have. So, what are modular forms? Uh, in a nutshell, I like to think of these things as series, like Taylor series. Series, you know, like, uh, well, it doesn't have to start with A0, but it could be A, like, usually the traditional letter to do these series in is, is Q. So these are often called Q series, uh, A2, Q squared, and so on, A3, Q to the third. So it's functions like these that have, have non-obvious symmetries. I'll try to explain non-obvious symmetries. Formal series, or they... At the moment, formal, but in fact, they will not be formal. They'll act on certain spaces. They'll converge in certain ranges and so on. Maybe so... That's right. But I, I mean, they, they, so let's talk about their birth. Um, their, their, so some prehistory, prehistory of these things mm -hmm. is that people started messing around with series. So this is like right after calculus. So calculus is like mid 1600s, Newton and Leibniz. Of course, there's Indian versions of these 200 years before them, but uh, we don't know, or at least I don't know all that much about what happened there. Um, so uh, the Bernoulli brothers are like the first AP Calc students, they're Leibniz's <laughs> students, and they teach a guy named Leonard Euler. So Euler has trouble getting a job. He's shipped out to St. Petersburg, and uh, eventually he wants to be in Basel, uh, eventually, he solves the Basel problem. So he solves the Basel problem. The Basel problem is is uh, so the Bernoullis. The Bernoullis were were very Bernoulli brothers, Johann and Jakob. And there's a whole distinguished family there. Uh, Daniel was a yeah. There's a there's a long list of them. Their father, Bert. Yes. Yes. I'll, and in fact, why don't I show it to you? Because it's really not that hard. The Bernoullis were very interested in the sum of the reciprocals of the squares. They knew that the series converges, but they had no idea what it was, right? So this is one over one plus one over four plus one over nine plus one over 16 and so on. And what is this thing? They could, they could numerically compute it to a bunch of decimals. Of course, you guys probably know it's pi squared over six, but this is what Euler uh, discovered. And it was an overnight sensation. It's like, uh, you know, he, he became uh, very, very famous immediately after this, and then did a whole bunch of incredible stuff after that. But this is kind of his big, uh, maybe this is where he gets tenure or something, right? <laughs> if you want to think about it that way, it's not exactly how things work. So, so. Nothing matched up. This was the you. A boiler? Yeah. <laughs> not even close. Uh, no, no, this was just the beginning. It was all up. It was. He published about Yes, yes, and he had he had won prizes and for other things, but they were all of a smaller. He was like mid twenties, because he was having he was like you know back then if you were twenty two and you didn't have you know uh, someone that was going to be paying your your bills like you know some royal person and you were in their court and you know your, your patron, um, then you were in trouble, and eventually he got a job in Saint Petersburg like I said. But he didn't want to go that far away. He wanted to stay in, in Basel, where he was he was born. And um, anyway, so uh, so how does he do it? Which which will be relevant to it's like again, it's not exactly Q series, but I want to show you sort of the the train of thought that leads to this kind of thing because it's very relevant to well to L functions in particular. So what does he do? He says, I know the function sine sine of x. So P Taylor was this is this is uh, 1730s. 1730. So Taylor had already worked out Taylor series. In fact, Newton had worked out Taylor series. In fact, Madhava, again, 200 years before, in certain cases, worked out Taylor series. Uh, so sine of x, he knows, is x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the 5th over 5 factorial minus x to the 7 over 7 factorial and so on. Right? And he knows the graph of sine. The sine function has zeros at pi, at 0, at 2 pi, at negative pi, and so on. And uh, what he wants to do is divide this series by x. So he divides it by x. So here I get one, x squared, 
x to the fourth, x to the sixth, and so on. If I divide this by x, this becomes an even function. Let's do that in red or something. So it's still zero here, but he knows the ratio of sine x over x is actually one as x goes to uh, zero. And so you get this function that's sort of getting smaller and smaller, right? Asymptotically, it's one over x and it's even. So, so he studies this, this function. And he's, uh, the other thing he knows is um, he knows if P is a polynomial of degree D, of degree D, with roots uh, A1 through AD, real numbers, these are all real numbers, and the, the value of the polynomial at zero is equal to one, then he knows everything about the polynomial. The polynomial, the only polynomial that satisfies these conditions is the polynomial one minus x over a one up to one minus x over a d. This is a polynomial of degree d. It has the roots. If I put in a one for x, I get one minus one. So this is zero. If I put in zero for x, I multiply ones a bunch of times. So, and, and I've specified n plus one piece of information, which is what you need to get the polynomial of degree d. So he says, okay, this sine x over x function, I know where its roots are. It, it takes the value zero at one, and I know what its roots are. So he says, well, then it should have this product. So it should be a one minus X over, there's a root at pi, and a one minus X over, there's a root at negative pi, and a one minus X over two pi, and a one, uh, sorry, that's a negative pi. Yeah, that's right. So one minus X over negative two pi. And so on. Well, this is a uh, one minus x over oh, negative okay. pi. So yeah, if you if you want to clear those those minus signs, okay. And if you multiply this out, he wants to know what the term of x squared is. So on this side, if I look at the term of x squared, so now now compare compare uh, terms, the x squared terms. This is his, his big observation. What's the X squared term here? I'm sorry, you mean the X squared term on the right hand? Yeah, yeah. there it is. Yeah, so the coefficient in front of it on one hand, so, so if I'm taking X squared terms, on one hand, I get a negative one over three factorial, which is negative six, okay? If I multiply all of this out, and by the way, I may as well simplify this a little bit. This is a difference of squares. So I get one minus X squared over pi squared. This is uh, one minus X squared over four pi squared. The next one will be one minus X squared over nine pi squared and so on. So I multi multiply all this out and I get the coefficient of X squared. So what do I get for the, for the X squared coefficient? I, I can take uh, minus one over pi squared and then ones everywhere else when I multiply this out and I foil this out. Or I can take a one here, minus one over four pi squared there and ones everywhere else. And, there's, and if I take more than one factor that isn't a one, I'll get an X to the fourth. So the only way to get an X squared is to, is to get uh, just one of these individually. And there you go, negative pi squared pulls out of all of this. On the other hand, I have negative a sixth, and then I have a sum of one plus what quarter plus a ninth plus a sixteenth. So there's your pi squared over six. So it's this idea of, con of considering an infinite product. This is what I wanna, uh, infinite product, infinite product versus an infinite series, infinite series, and, and an equal sign between the two that uh, gets you juicy information, right? So he realizes this can lead to uh, stuff, good stuff, information. And of course, the, one of the very next things he does is he realizes that the Euler, that the uh, Riemann zeta function, Riemann's not born for a hundred years, uh, that the Riemann zeta function has an Euler product formula. So this is this uh, thing we've been, doing all semester long. And uh, for the people who are just joining us, um, if you take one over one minus lambda, 
just write it out. Using the fact that one over one minus lambda is a geometric series. Formally, if you like, although this converges absolutely if lambda has absolute value less than one. So when the real part of S is greater than one, this uh, does converge and can be expanded. Uh, we can write this as one plus uh, one over P to the S plus one over P to the two S plus one over P to the three S and so on. And when you multiply all of these out, you get every number uniquely by the, uh, by the fundamental theorem of arithmetic that every number is uniquely expressible as a sum of prime powers. He doesn't stop there. So this is like 1737 or so. He uses this. He uses this. So he didn't have push in series, right? So he's like taking this into the thought and it turns out it is nice. So he's but like so he's thinking of the tools to prove this. So oh you mean this? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So uh <laughs> in fact, if he tried to do the same thing for the Riemann zeta function, he does discover the uh negative uh even zeros of zeta. And if he tried to do the same thing for the zeta function, he would fall flat on his face because he's only considering this as a real valued function in S. He doesn't know about the complex zeros. So this really, the reason this actually works uh, is because the sine function as a complex analytic function still has only zeros uh, along here. But Weierstrass theory of Hadamard, Hadamard factorization tells you how to actually do this, but that's 150 years after. Right. you. Yeah, so, so people don't actually trust his first proof. He gives several other proofs using Fourier analysis, but once you know the value, you can sort of start imagining how. You can start actually adding up these numbers and seeing them. Well, you can, before you know the value, you can add them up numerically. So people could compute 20 decimal places. They still had no idea what they were looking for, right? And yeah. let me point out that we still don't know what the, if you take the cubes instead of the squares, one over 27 and one over uh, 64, thank you, and 125 and so on. What's that? That's zeta of three. Nope. And not only do we not know what that is, we don't know that that thing is transcendental. We do know it's irrational, but that was only proved in the 70s. Oh, no. That's all we know. For the odd value, no. For all odd values of, yeah, for all odd powers. For all even powers, this method, because it gets the even powers, it, you see the even powers here. Like if you want to do the fourth power, you take pairs of these things and you compare that to what you know about zeta of two. And you, so this is, this is called, so Bernoulli numbers already existed. So he recognized the pattern between Bernoulli numbers and the values of the zeta function of the even integers. Um, so he would have fallen flat on his face if he tried the same trick for zeta. Luckily, he never did. <laughs> and he got lucky that the sine function. Uh, <laughs> who knows? Um, anyway, so, uh, right. So he used this fact to prove, so he proved that the sum of the reciprocals of the primes diverges. And as we, I think we discussed, Dirichlet mimicked his argument. So this is, this is the fact that a half plus a third plus a fifth plus a seventh, not a ninth, an eleventh, a thirteenth, and so on, right? One over the primes, that, that sum is infinite. The sledgehammer proof of the infinitude of primes. That's right, that's right. <laughs> Euclid had already proved the infinitude. Here's a new proof. It seemed like, okay, that's cute. But then Dirichlet comes along and says, not only is it cute, it, it can be done in progressions and solves a major problem. Okay, so what I, what I actually, so this is the prehistory to the prehistory. But very shortly uh, after this kind of stuff, he starts playing with the partition function. So let's talk about the partition function. Partition function. So the partition function, how many, how many ways are there to write five as a sum of whole numbers? Well, five works. You can uh, write it as four plus one. That's another way of writing five. Um, what's the largest number I can use? So I've used four and that's it. I, that's all I can get out of there. I can use a three and a two. I can use a three and two ones. That's all I can do with a three. I can do two twos and a one. And that's all I can do with twos. Oh, no, I can do a two and three ones. And then my only other option is five ones. So how many partitions are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So P of five is seven. Okay. And if you want to work out the partitions of 27, good luck. Okay, it's a huge number and it's going to be a massive headache to try to keep track of, have I tried this combination? Have I tried that combination? You know, people were very uh, stumped by this, by this function, which arises in uh, all kinds of uh, natural applications, as you may imagine. So what he starts playing with, uh, so Euler starts playing 
with the Q series. He just makes it a Q series. One plus, well, partitions of one is not so hard. There's only one way to partition one. But then partitions of two, Q squared, partitions of three, Q cubed, and so on. Okay, so this is the sum of the partition function times two to the n. And he realizes that this series can be related to a product in exactly the same way that his Euler series can be related to an Euler product. So, so here's his uh, big idea. If you take one over one minus Q, well, what is one over one minus Q? That's one plus Q plus Q squared. Again, formally at the moment, not worried about where this converges. Um, and I multiply that by one minus one over Q squared. So that's one plus Q squared plus Q to the fourth plus Q to the sixth and so on. And I multiply that by one minus Q cubed, which is so times one plus Q cubed plus Q to the sixth plus Q to the nine and so on. And one minus Q to the fourth and one minus Q to the fifth and, and all, all powers like this, assuming such a series can, uh, can be made and it, it, it can, as long as Q is less than one in absolute value. Again, he's still not thinking about the complex right. <laughs> uh, values. So he's thinking about, well, he's thinking formally actually, but he does know that it, if Q is less than one in absolute value as a real number, it converges. He does know complex numbers. He's just not thinking about functions of complex numbers. Right. Um, uh, Q to the fourth. Well, even to say that he knows about complex numbers may be giving him too much credit. Anyway, watch what happens when you multiply all this out. What is the coefficient of Q to the fifth? So how can I get a five out of here? I can take a five from here and one's everywhere else. That's this. Taking a five from here and one's everywhere else. Or I can take... Um, I can take three ones, I can take the Q cubed term and this Q squared term and ones everywhere else. That's this partition. Or I can take a Q to the one term and a Q to the four term from here. That's two twos and a one. Or I can take two ones and a three. That's this partition or the Q squared term times the Q cubed term is that partition. And the Q to the four term times a Q is that partition or one plus Q to the five, or if I just take Q to the five and one's everywhere else. And so he recognizes this infinite product is nothing more than this function, the summation of the partition. Okay. This thing is, it's not itself, uh, modular form, but it's very close to a modular. So, uh, so this is the prehistory. So this is like infinite products turning into infinite series where the series have arithmetic information, like the partition function. There's a long story about Ramanujan getting really interested in the asymptotics of the partition function, being able to compute them very quickly. He and Hardy invent the precursor to the circle method in order to get an asymptotic formula for the partition function. There's a whole long story there. Let me not go into that. Um, let, let's, let's, so this was a prehistory. Let's take a little tour of the kinds of things, uh, modular forms appear out of seemingly nowhere. So, so, uh, Kepler, Kepler in, uh, 1600s, 1610s, I'll just put 1611, maybe that's right, uh, is thinking about sphere patterns, sphere patterns, equal sphere patterns. Sphere patterns. And, and uh, in particular, what's the densest way? Densest. So, so you're thinking of cannonballs. You're going to take a bunch of cannonballs and load a ship, a big ship with cannonballs. How are you going to stack those cannonballs? They're all, the same. They're all the same. They're all the same. They're all cannonballs. And how are you going to, you know, like a grocer stacking oranges, right? Densest possible configuration. And he can think of two. Um, one is to, at one layer, do a hexagonal packing in spheres, and then at the next layer, put another such right on top of those spheres. Another option is to take a square configuration at one, at the first layer. And now you see there's more space here. 
So it seems like a bad idea as opposed to the, the hexagonal configuration. But because there's more space, when I take the next layer of spheres, this, these spheres actually sit a little farther down when I, when I put these spheres on top. And it turns out that these two have this, one of these is the face centered uh, as opposed to the hexagonal cubic uh, packing as opposed to the face uh, centered cubicle packing. Um, so it turns out that these have the same density. Density meaning you look at how much volume is taken up by the balls in a big ball and, and portion to the volume of the ball itself and then take the limit as, uh, as the radius goes to infinity. So these both, both, uh, a pack about 74% of space. And the question is one's rectangular, one is rectangular, or so it's rectangular in, in a level, and then the next level is is on top of that. Yeah. So I'm so I'm just I'm filling up all of space with, with balls. Uh pack 74% of space. Can one do better? Can one do better? Um, and there's a long story. Again, I, I won't go into all the details. Uh, Gauss uh, shows that if it's uh, lattice packing, then, then the answer is no. Um, but there's no restriction on it being a lattice. By the way, um, what, what's this number 74? Yeah. It's like pi times root three. I mean, it's a simple computation. Uh, you take one, you take a region and you sit, you know, and you just compute the volume of the the balls divide because these are, are lattices. You just take one fundamental domain, and you have some simple computation over the volume of a sphere minus the the volume of the ball that's that's there. So it's something like pi root three. I don't know. That's too big over four. That's too small over eight. It's it's some simple number. <laughs> I don't remember it off the top of my head, but it's a simple computation. It's like got pies and stuff. So this seventy four percent is is very well understood. It's some it's some explicit number. I'm sorry. So these two they want to uh, translate in, in the translation by some kind of equation. Yeah. So these are two different configurations. You can they, think of them. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. But in, in fact, what? Uh, so there's actually infinitely many uh, densest configurations because you can do one at one layer. You can do a bunch of layers of one type and then switch and go back and forth between the two. They'll, they'll sort of nest within one another. And so you'll still get something as dense as, uh, as either of them. So in, in uh, anyway, so the, the long story short, in, uh, in, in 90, 1998, so Tom Hales uh, announces finally a proof of Kepler's conjecture. It's, it's based on uh, Faye Toth work from the 40s and 50s, who shows that this conjecture can be boiled down to checking a bunch of cases. That bunch is tens of millions. So it's something human beings will never do. And Hale says, well, okay, we've got computers. We can probably do this. So, uh, it's probably Nick. Pi over three root two, thank you. Pi over three root two. I had a three and I had a two, but not in the right, and this n square root but not in the right place, pi over three root, pi over three root two, pi over three. Yeah, whatever it is, yeah, thanks. Okay, so um, so this is a massive, now it's not the first time, you know, the four color theorem is the first time there was a massive computer uh, component checking individual cases and people didn't like it then and they didn't like it in 98. So this is a, a massive computation uh, we're coming to that, where and it sat uh, at the annals for for many years, and uh, eventually annals does publish it, but they they append to it something that they've never appended to any paper before or since. Although many papers since have been found to be incorrect, and this paper was found to be correct, uh, but they said we're only ninety nine percent certain that this group <laughs> is right, but we couldn't find a referee willing to rewrite their own version of this code spend 10 years doing that, the same 10 years Hales spent writing the code in the first place and running it independently to verify that the computations are right. And if one of these computations is wrong, you know, some uh, uh, particle from, from space changes a bit, then the whole proof falls apart, right? So, um, so Annals says that they're, 
uh, the annals said so they're 99% sure, which again is better than, <laughs> than the certainty with which they publish all the other papers they publish. Of course, of course. Uh, I, I don't know that there's a direct quote. They, they might not put a number on it. They say, we're nearly certain that the proof is correct, but we can't find, but we can't referee it in the way we referee other things. Well, and, as, things wrong. and many other things turn out to be wrong. So they do publish. They do publish. Uh, Hales, of course, is not happy about this. And so in 2003, he initiates, initiates what becomes known as the fly spec, fly spec project which is the formal proof of Kepler. This is formal proof of Kepler. And uh, by 2014, he and a team of 20 uh, collaborators, you're just in time. Well, you're, you're about to appear. Yeah. Um, so in 2014, he, um, he, so they finished the project. The project is a uh, uh, formal, complete, uh, complete, Formal proof. This is still for this dimension three. Yes, a complete formal proof in dimension three uh, with uh, lots of collaborators. Uh, you know, twenty collaborators. This is Hall. Yeah, yeah. A combination of yeah. Okay, so. Uh, as you said, this is all still in dimension three. That was all the three D. Uh, in two D, it's uh, two actually from eighteen ninety eight, ninety six, ninety eight. Ninety six is prime number theorem. That's a yeah. Too many things in one year. Let's go. It's eighteen nineties. Uh, claims a proof that the hexagonal packing coins right. You just put lay out coins on a on a, a plane on your desk. So the hexagonal packing is optimal, and I don't. I never looked at this argument closely, but uh, anyway, Feyd Feyd uh corrects the the proof. So certainly by the forties. I think that the current understanding of this. Yes. The original proof is basically okay. Okay. But it's really seems like we have now. Now wasn't really developed yet. Like we need like like Euler's work on this data function is not very good because it's predated to come up with an L. That's right. So. so the, the, the rules weren't quite set. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. So he basically uh, basically had it, but it took people until the '40s to be convinced that he had it. Um, right. So in four dimensions, so four dimensional sphere packings. Uh, do you guys know what the best uh, what the best packing is? Yeah. Nobody knows. We still don't know. <laughs> okay. So it's good that you don't know, because if you knew, then you should tell us. Um, in fact, in five dimensions, uh, we, we don't, we don't know the answer, right? We have, we have, uh, bounds and, and we have candidates, um, in eight dimensions. So this continues for six, seven, eight, and eight dimensions for many years, there was a candidate, which is called the E8 lattice. This is, I'm getting there. That's exactly right. I'm getting there. Uh, the E8 lattice is something very easy to describe. So it's, uh, N tup uh, eight tuples of integers. So this, these are points in R8. These are, I'm describing the centers. Of this of the spheres, so this is the the centers are at the lattice, uh, with the condition that either all of the n i are integers, or all of the n i are half integers. They're either all integers or half integers, and the sum of the n i. Well, whether they're integers or half integers, when you add up eight of them, you get an integer. That sum needs to be an even number. So these conditions are all that it takes to specify what the points are in eight dimensions that form the so-called E8 lattice, okay? The distance between the nearest neighbor, distance uh, to nearest neighbor, nearest point is uh, root two. That's a, a simple computation. And so if you want these to be, well, they're not unit balls, but they're balls of radius root two over two. So you take half that radius so that they're, they're just uh, packed in. Um, and uh, okay, so as, as we were getting uh, to in 2016, Maria Vizovska, Yazovska, Yazovska, uh, showed that in fact this is based on uh, work of, of many people, um, but she she finally showed using heavily using modular forms uh, that uh, this E8 lattice is the de densest lattice uh, is the densest densest 
and it is not. Well, she uses computers to find the, the modular form, but it is not at all computer based. Once she finds it, the proof is just a, a regular human proof with no. In the fine, so in, even in the refinements? But is it still the case that you need integral arithmetic to do it? Hasn't it been? Uh, right. In other words, the positivity of, yeah. of the sum of squares. Yeah. Right. Um, so, so a few weeks uh, after this, three days, but it, but, but posted on archive a week later. Okay. Uh -huh. So Vyazovska and several collaborators, including our chair, Nick. Okay, well, well, there we are. Uh, showed that in fact, the in 24 dimension, the something called the leech lattice uh, also is the densest. So all of a sudden we went from knowing just, okay, one dimension, there's nothing, the, the, the spheres are intervals. So you can pack everything perfectly just with intervals. Um, there's no question. So we know one, two, three, we still know nothing. And all of a sudden in the span of a week, we learned about eight dimensions and 24 dimensions, um, which they're very special modular form reason for, for these things. So now we know these, these are the only other dimensions where the densest packing is known. And uh, as Teddy said, uh, uh, Marina won the Fields Medal for this this past summer. So there's nothing on four? Well, we have, we have conjectures, but, but there's no theorems. Well, there are theorems, but the theorems aren't, we have upper bounds and lower bounds and no one can close. So she closed the distance, which is, uh, okay. yeah, based on Cohn and Elkies and, and Steve's work. So the, so the, the, in four, the, the upper and lower bounds are pretty far off. Mm -hmm. In eight dimensions, Henry and I have found the green. I don't know where we're going to be. Oh, right. Very close. Right. Um, yeah. So there's no group in the uh, 24 dimension? Or? There is the leech lattice. I didn't know. What, uh, it's something with a similar definition. I mean, it's a more complicated. I mean, E8. Uh, E8. So I've defined the lattice for you. Right. So that's a group, right? E8 is there. So, yeah, right, there's the E8 Lie group, there's the E8 lattice, the, there's the e, E8 arises in, in all kinds of things. There's the E8 uh, reflection group. Uh, E8 is a, is a term that's, you know, used. It, 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 there's a Dinkin diagram for E8, right. Is the Dinkin diagram for 24? No. Uh, no, yeah, yeah. That's that, that was your question. Yeah. I, I was hoping to get to a couple other things. I was just going to touch on this. There is one other thing. So, so just to give you a hint as to uh, how modular forms arise here. Okay. So if you look at the number of, uh, before we leave the E8 uh, lattice, if you look at the number of points in the E8 lattice, number of points um, at distance, at distance, at some distance, um, in other words, points uh, on a sphere uh, at some distance in E8. So let's let's look in the plane for a second. This is asking in the plane, if I have points X and Y, integer points, this is in Z2. I wanna know how many points there are so that the sum of the squares, well, the sum of the squares, if X and Y are integers, sum of the squares is gonna be some integer. And you might wanna know, uh, how many ways is are there to write n as a sum of two squares? And this is what Fermat answers, right? Fermat uh, tells us uh, the solution to this problem. The solution in the 24-dimensional problem, it asks, so, so uh, i.e., if I have um, one of these nj's, so I want to sum the nj squared, and, and I want to know when is that equal to an integer. 
In fact, that integer has to be even. And so you might ask, how many points are there in the E8 lattice on a sphere of radius root 2n from the origin? And the answer is 240 times a sum over the divisors of the number n of those divisors cubed. That's just a fact, uh, something that uh, can be can be proved, but I'm not going to take the time to prove it. Okay, and if you take these things, if you take these counts and you make a function out of them, let's call that function e. So it's defined as one plus a sum over n of 240 times this. This this has a name. This is called the divisor function. It's called sigma three of n. It's the sum over the cubes of the divisors of n. So this is sigma three of n. And you multiply this by q to the n. This thing is a modular form. Is a modular form. What is it? Specify q in terms of z. Yes, I, I have to explain why I put a z here instead of a q. I mean, I could put a q here. Uh, and then it it looks right, but actually the right the right thing is to put it here. It's the Eisenstein series, the weight four Eisenstein series and the whole module. So so let me explain why I put a z here. For this to converge, we need q to be an absolute value less than one. So I can take q to be in the complex unit disk. Here's the unit disk in the complex plane, and uh, you can take a coordinate on on this disk by saying q is equal to e to the two pi i z. Where z, in order for this, what's the absolute value of this? The absolute value of q is then z is x plus i y. So e to the 2 pi i x has absolute value 1. But e to the 2 pi i i, e to the 2 pi i times i is e to the minus 2 pi y. If z is x plus i y. So z is x plus i y. And so if we want this to be less than 1, less than 1, we want y to be positive. So z has to live in the upper half plane. The upper half plane is the part of the complex plane with, with the imaginary part being positive. So if I treat this as a function of the parameter z, one thing we notice immediately is that just by our choice of coordinates, if I replace z by z plus 1, e to the 2 pi i is 1. So it doesn't change anything about this e function. So our coordinate system automatically tells us that this is invariant under z goes to z plus one. That's a symmetry of the function. That's an obvious symmetry. If I replace z, so here's something crazy. If I replace z, if I replace z by negative one over z. So what does that do? Um, if I replace z by um, z over norm z squared, that takes a point in the upper half plane and inverts it through the unit circle. Well, z over z norm z squared is z times z bar. So if I cancel the z's on top and bottom, I get one over z bar. So instead of inverting through the unit circle, I'm going to take the negative of that. So that puts me down here. So this is if this is z, then this point is z over norm z squared. And this point is negative z over norm z squared. And then I apply the complex conjugate. And that gets me to this point, and that's the point negative one, negative one over z. So if I replace z by negative one over z, I almost get e of z itself. It's almost invariant under this transformation, this kind of reflection across the unit circle and across the y-axis. It's almost invariant under that. It's off by a factor of z to the fourth. So if you so if you replace z by negative one over z, you get the same thing with a factor of z to the fourth. This is the non-obvious. This is what I mean by a Q series made up of these coefficients that came from somewhere. They're counting points at some distance in a lattice, and yet uh, so this is what I am referring to a non-obvious symmetry. Symmetry. And uh, if you look back, so this is as a function on the upper half plane. If you look back as a function on the disk in Q. So the, the formal series can't see this. The formal series, well, it has the symmetry in it if you just replace Q by e to the 2 pi i z. Yeah. You need the complex numbers and you need to, that's right. That's right. So it's, so it's not something just, that's just a function of uh, the formal series. You, you really want to understand this as a complex analytic. 
And so if you look at the function, the values of the function in the disk, what you will see is something like this. This is from a quanta article that just came out, you know, a day or two ago. <laughs> so I saw this, I said, perfect. That's exactly, so this is exactly what one of these uh, things looks like as a function on the disk. What is it? This is, this is some modular form. So the, the complex plane is down here. Its height is telling you the absolute value. And then the shading is telling you the argument. Mm -hmm. And so you can see these, these bizarre symmetries occurring as a result of uh, the symmetries in Z going to Z plus one and negative one over Z. Is it uh, it's bounded actually on the, on the boundary. Yeah, so you so you actually you can see that the value of this as z goes to as as a uh, y goes to infinity. I'm sorry, uh, that's that's uh, the homomorphicity at infinity. When z goes to infinity, e to the two pi i z q goes to zero. Yeah, and uh, and uh, so the value of the function as q goes to zero goes to one. That's that's not the the, the value at the boundary here when q goes to uh, when when z when y goes to zero, when y goes to zero and q approaches a uh, root of unity, approaches the unit circle, then the function has all kinds of uh, wild behavior, which is what you're what you're seeing here. I mean, this is the theory of uh, distributions, automorphic distributions, is is here at the boundary. Steve walked off just just in time, not to hear his name again. Um, okay, so this is just a hint, just the first hint at the kinds of places where modular forms arise, what they are, that there are these non-obvious symmetries. And of course, once you have the symmetry z goes to z plus one and z goes to negative one over z, you can think about the group that those two symmetries generate. And in fact, those two symmetries, when you think about, we're gonna get to fractional linear transformations, uh, those two symmetries uh, generate the full group SL2z. And then you can encode this one functional equation into an infinite family of functional equations. And that's what it means to be modular. Okay. That's right. Well, I guess once you have these two, then then it sort of becomes obvious how to combine them. But it's getting this one in the first place that I would argue is that. I guess I said of me to an outsider, you just show them. That's right. If I tell you the definition, right. I mean, so I can tell you the definition now of a modular form. If A, B, C, D is a two by two integer matrix with determinant one. Please. Dimension. Yes. It's a very similar argument. Yeah. Yes. Yes. This this argument very heavily uses modular forms in a highly non-obvious way. Uh, I'm not telling you anything about that argument. I just want to give you a hint as to the relationship between these things and modular forms. Yes. So so just to finish, what the full group of symmetries is, if you replace z by a z plus b over C, Z plus D, these are called fractional linear transformations, the ratio of linear transformations, where the determinant of A, D minus B, C is one, and uh, these are all integers, so it's that's the special linear group with integer entries. This will almost be the value of E of Z itself. It'll differ by C, Z plus D to the power four in this case, and a general modular form replaces four by any positive even integer. <laughs> And replaces SL2Z by some kind of yeah, it's a weird thing if you if you're just told the definition, but actually uh, realizing it from some particular examples is, is a very natural well, the thing. Coefficients of this thing. The coefficients of this thing are very weird. If you know, there's a little calculation here, in the same way that the sum of two squares is a. It, by the way, we've already seen the function that gets the sum of two squares in its coefficients. You know where where we saw this. Remember what the classical theta function is? The classical theta function of t is a sum of e to the two pi uh, n squared t. Okay, or just let's let's do uh, well e to the minus two pi n squared t as as n ranges in the integers, right? If t is positive, then this thing converges nicely. Um, really, what I want to do is e to the two pi i n squared z e to the 2 pi i n squared z, where z is again in the upper half plane. If I take z to be um, uh, an abstract, uh, this is, so if, two, if e to the 2 pi i z is q, then this is a sum over n of q squared, q to the n squared. 
Exactly, there's a half half integral weight modular form. But this thing is uh, what we were studying um, when we when we proved the functional equation for the um, for the Riemann zeta function. This this is the theta function whose Mellon transform is and and as and as many generalizations, right? So uh, so the point is, if I take z in the upper half plane, then this does converge absolutely. But if I take theta squared, theta of z squared, what is this? So if I square this out, it's a sum over n and m, q to the n squared plus m squared. So it's exactly a sum. If I combine these into q to the k, k in the integers, this is a sum of the number of ways of writing k as uh, n squared plus m squared. So we've seen it's very natural to take this, this series and uh, study sums of squares. So it's very natural to take this series and study um, you know, what happens to the number of points. All right, anyway, let, let me move on to, I, I wanted to give you, this is the one application. I wanted to give you three applications of modular forms just to show you how they arise in all kinds of crazy ways. Okay, um, application two is, um, what do I wanna do? All right, let's do elliptic curves. So, so here's a function. Uh, I'll also call it E, not not to E for elliptic curve, not not for Eisenstein here. This, well, what can you do? Um, let me just write a random function down. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to read off any of my numerics. It, it, I, I was I pre-computed some of these values. So so here's a function. Here's a function. What does this look like? Uh, what are the real points? This is just some relationship between x and y. It's a curve in the plane. Right. What do the real points on this curve look like? So, um, so for example, if x and y are both zero, I get zero. If y is zero on this side, I get zero. Where else do I have zeros? Actually, I have a double zero at zero for x, and I have a zero when x is one. Right. This factor is the x squared pulls out. So when x is one, y is zero. How about on the other hand, if x is zero, y is zero at at uh, at zero and at negative one. And so this, this thing will look something like a double zero there, and then it's going to cross there and go like that. So that's what the real points uh, of this thing look like. And now you can ask, um, how many points are there, the number of x and y in z mod n, let's say z mod pz, for which uh, this relationship holds, for which y squared plus y is congruent to x cubed minus x squared mod p. And you'll get some number. And uh, roughly the number you'll get, so as x ranges, um, x cubed, this is a cubic polynomial in x and a quadratic in y, a cubic polynomial um, will range roughly over all of the values. So like the, the cube, the set of values of cubes is the same as a set of values of, is just a permutation of, of the values from zero to p minus one. Um, so here we're roughly getting all the values, which of them are, let's say there wasn't a y here, which of them are perfect squares, about half of them are perfect squares. But there, but the half arise with a with a y and a negative y. This is a quadratic, yeah, quadratic reciprocity. Which numbers are squares? Might be. And so you expect roughly p solutions. You should actually add a point at infinity, and then you'd expect p plus one solution. And then there's an error term, and that error term is called a of p. Okay, so let's just see this in practice. Um, let's say p is equal to three. If p is equal to three then my values of x are 0, 1, and 2, and my values of y are 0, 1, and 2. We've done this kind of thing before. So then what are the values of x squared? x squared is 0, 1 squared is 1, 2 squared, 2 times 2 is 4, which is 1 mod 3, and x cubed is x squared times x. So it's this times this, 1, and then 1 times 2 is 2. So that's what I mean. x cubed is just a permutation, in this case, the trivial permutation of the values of x itself. Okay, how about y? Uh, what is y squared? Oh, and then finally, what is x cubed minus x squared? x cubed minus x squared is, so I take this and subtract that. So I get zero, this minus that is zero, and this minus that is one. So x cubed minus x squared, depending on the value of x, is zero or zero or one. How about y squared? y squared again is zero, one, one, and now I wanna know y squared plus y. 
y squared plus y. So the sum of these two is zero, the sum of these two is two, and the sum of these two is zero. And so my question is for which values of this side agree with the values on in this row, agree with the values of this column. So when I have zeros, so this, this is an agreement, this is an agreement, this is an agreement, and this is an agreement, and the other values are not. So the number of solutions in this case, so uh, for P equals three, I get four is equal to P is three plus A of three. So A of three is, uh, is one. Okay, so this is the error term from the expected value. And what you do, now I'm gonna lie a little bit, you can make a series in the same way, we're gonna make this series associated to the elliptic curve, which is a sum of A of n's times Q to the n. This isn't quite right. There's, there's something slightly more uh, involved that you do, but it's morally what, what, you, what you do. In fact, that possible. Um, okay. And it turns out, let me not try to, uh, well, certainly let me not try to convince you that that's the case for, for this curve, but it turns out that uh, this function, when you do this operation the right way, turns out is modular is a modular form. Okay, so you take an, uh, an elliptic curve, you take this elliptic curve, you can find a modular form whose uh, Q series agrees on, at, at least at the primes, with this uh, error for the number of points there are on the elliptic curve mod P. And so the question became, so this became known as the Taniyama Shimura Bay conjecture, Taniyama Shimura, Shimura Taniyama Bay, Bay, or just modularity, modularity conjecture. This is in the 50s, uh, that later was recognized as a, a part of the Langlands program. Of course, Langlands program is much later, 60s, 70s. Um, so they they said every elliptic curve, every is it true? So this is the conjecture, uh, every elliptic curve elliptic curve is modular. In other words, when you form this Q series, you get a modular form, is modular. And in the mid eighties, a guy named Gerhard Frey had this crazy, crazy, I have no idea where he got this from idea. Okay, he says, if there's a solution, A to the P plus B to the P equals C to the P, where P, well, P could be anything, but uh, of course, I'm referring to Fermat's last theorem. Uh, so it suffices to check Fermat's last theorem on the primes, because if you had a solution, uh, if there are no solution, if you had a solution uh, to this for any integer greater than n, you would have a solution for some uh, prime uh, exponent. So, so p is some prime exponent greater than the primality. Never mind; it's not so important. If you had a solution, if uh, a non-trivial solution, the product of a, b, c is non-zero, and a, b, c are all integers. A, B, C are all integers. If you had an integer, if in other words, if, i.e., if Fermat's last theorem, Fermat's last theorem is false, then he said, you look at this elliptic curve, y squared equals x times x minus a to the p times x plus b to the p. And because a to the p plus b to the p is itself c to the p, this elliptic curve would have very, very strange properties. And he said he thinks this elliptic curve would not be modular. Might not be modular. Might not be modular. I have no idea where he got this idea. How would you even think of combining these two completely unrelated uh, theories? But this is what I, this is exactly what I'm trying to tell you. Modular forms are everywhere. Okay. Shortly after that, Sarah and Ribbit, Sarah and and uh, so this is these are two two separate uh, works. Said yes, will not be modular. So if you can prove the Taniyama Shimura Bay conjecture that every elliptic curve is modular, then there can't be a solution to Fermat's equation. There can't be a counterexample to Fermat. Most people saw this as well. Now we've reduced one impossible problem, Fermat's last theorem, to another. Taniyama Shimura Bay, uh, but thankfully Wiles, Wiles, not Bay, Andrew Wiles, 
Andrew Wiles, spent seven years in isolation, famously uh, announced the proof of Fermat's last theorem. And uh, so you actually know that this uh, elliptic curve is going to be uh, semi-stable, and uh, he only needed enough of the modularity. And eventually, people after him came in and filled in the rest of the modularity. Yeah, so he did it. He got, uh, proved enough. So he claimed, uh, proved enough of the modularity conjecture, enough modularity uh, to conclude Fermat's last theorem. Uh, he announced this. Uh, Nick Katz was going through it and said, wait a second, I think this isn't quite right. It went back and forth. A... Oh, that's a whole other, that's Gower representations. It's a whole other story about uh, how to go through, like, you know how many modular forms there are, you know how many elliptic curves there are. And so every modular form gives rise to an elliptic curve, but the question is, does it go the other way? I mean, that already is Eichler is, is a very, um, uh, it's a well understood thing over the rationals. Uh, anyway, let me let me not even go into that. Um, so uh, Katz, you know, said, wait a second, this this part I don't understand. They went back and forth. He spent uh, another year trying to fix the argument. Eventually, uh, with the help of Taylor, they fixed. It. So this is former student Richard Taylor. Um, so Wiles and Wiles Taylor uh, had enough to to fix the parts of modularity to give the mod last year. Okay. Um, so it's another place, a very, very un completely shockingly unrelated, seemingly unrelated place where modular forms play a, a key role. So people would ask, right, how do you get the idea? Of I don't know. I mean, just like. He's come up with a couple of really crazy things in his career. He's a, a very uh, creative guy. All right. Uh, I have one more example for you. Sorry? Fermat <laughs> had no idea about this stuff. There's no way he knew anything about modular forms, elliptic curves. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Let me give you. Uh, all right. I have time for one more. Let, let me. Uh, which of these should I do? Let me tell you, since we're on elliptic curves, um, there's something called the J invariant. Okay. So how far should I go back? If I tell you x squared plus y squared is equal to one, can you find a parametrization? Can you parametrize this curve? Parametrization. Well, good question. <laughs> It could be uh, real valued or complex valued. Let's say over over Archimedean uh, extensions of Q. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, can you uh, can you parameterize a circle? You guys know a parameterization of the circle? Please say it. Sine, cosine, and sine. Right, exactly. <laughs> okay, cosine and sine parameterize the circle. Right. If I change the values of theta, so theta ranges in the lattice. Uh, in in the reals modulo two pi z, right? That 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 circle. Uh, this is some lattice. This is a lattice. This is a one dimensional lattice, and uh, that parametrizes the circle. Um, what if I gave you an elliptic curve? Y squared equals x cubed plus a x plus b. I've written it now in uh, Weierstrass form, but this is some. Um, this is again a quadratic in y is equal to a cubic in x. So do you know how to parameterize this? Well, okay, Forrest knows, but uh, so what you do is you make something called a Weierstrass p-function. So Weierstrass figured this out and there's something called a p-function. I won't tell you what it is. Um, uh, let me call this a function of w. And it turns out that if you set x equal to the Weierstrass p-function and y equal to its derivative, the derivative of the Weierstrass p-function, this is some crazy thing. Um, the p-function is described in terms of a lattice. So the p-function depends on a lattice. Lambda is a lattice, is a lattice in the complex numbers. In the complex numbers. Lattice, so, so a lattice in the complex numbers um, is, uh, well, a lattice is like something, uh, that looks like z squared. So I can normalize the lattice by saying that uh, one of my generators is one, one of my basis vectors is one, 
And another of my basis vectors is some point uh, Z in the upper half plane. Okay, so I take all combinations of one and Z. So I have Z minus one, Z plus one, I have two Z. So it's just a Euclidean lattice. Euclidean lattice, you know, the set of skewed. Yeah, some, some lattice like this. Okay, so Z defines uh, a point in the upper half plane. So one and Z are, the, are my generators of a lattice. So, so the lattice is generated by one and some, and some point Z in the upper half plane. This will be um, in the same way that this function takes values in a lattice. The P function will also take values in the lattice. And then uh, there's an equation. So what Weierstrass proved is that if you square the derivative of P prime, you'll get the cube of P prime plus, I'll leave a space here, uh, P plus, plus another space. And what goes here, A and B, but A is given by E of Z, that exactly same function that we saw, the same function E of Z, this Eisenstein series, wait for Eisenstein series, arises here. And there's another one called the, the wait six Eisenstein series that arises here. And it's a function of W, a, a function of Z, a function of the lattice. That's right. That's right. So the A and the B play are played the play this role. And then for any uh, A and B, you can find these values, and that'll be your parametrization. So these this uh bar stress P function and its derivative parametrize elliptic curves in the same way these some transcendental functions, in the same way that the transcendental functions sine and cosine parametrize the circle. These are complex, complex values, yeah. Um, the discriminant, well, let me go to the J invariant. So there's, there's something called the J invariant, J invariant of an elliptic curve. So an elliptic curve is determined by this lattice. Given any lattice, you have, the, you have an elliptic curve because given a lattice, you can construct the functions E, Z, e, E4 and E6 and the functions P, which depend on the lattice. And then for arbitrary values of W, W in, W in C modulo the lattice. So this is all in C. This is all, this is all over C. This is complex, uh, yeah, complex analytic functions, parametrizing uh, elliptic curves. So the J invariant turns out to be a function J of Z, which is this uh, elliptic, this Eisenstein series cubed divided by, all right, I have to tell you what the discriminant function is. So the discriminant of the elliptic curve. Um, yeah, it's, re it's re related to that. Uh, the, I've, I've taken out the 1728. Uh, so this will be divided by the, this is Q times the product of one minus Q to the N, N bigger than one, all to the 24th power. So this part of the function we have seen before. The, at the very beginning, one over that function is where we got the partition function. So that's what I mean by the prehistory to modular forms. But it turns out that this delta is a modular form. I'm going to come back to this delta. We're going to talk about this again in a, in a second. What part is being Well, the whole thing or just each? It doesn't matter. Oh, okay. Because a product, yeah, but but I do think of it as each each part is being raised to the twenty fourth, and you multiply it overall. But you don't. You need to take this in z in q in the disk so that everything converges regardless of which order you multiply. It. Okay. So this quotient, right? This is again. This is just some very explicit one plus a sum over n two hundred forty times the divisor sum to the third power times q to the uh, n and divided by this q times uh, one minus q to the 24 times one minus q squared to the 24 and so on. You just multiply all these things out. And you, again, you turn these into infinite series and you can work out these coefficients and people did. And you see there's a one everywhere to start things off except there's a q here. So it starts with q inverse. The next term, what's the constant term? In other words, what's the linear term without the Q and then the Q divides, divides out the linear term. It turns out to be 744. The term in front of Q is uh, 196884, 196884. 
the term in front of Q squared turns out to be 2149307970 Q squared and so on and you get these crazy crazy numbers when you work out this this j function okay now this was this is all this is like felix klein uh, understood uh, well weierstrass is 1880s klein is understanding this j invariant ramanujan is studying this discriminant function people people know these numbers okay uh, complete aside, aside, by the 1970s, we are very uh, confident that there should exist something that classifies finite groups. So we're trying to understand finite groups. To understand finite groups, it's enough in some sense, although that's not really true, it's enough to understand finite simple groups. So finite simple groups, you know, if you're thinking like uh, PSL2 or PSL23, on z mod 17z or whatever right so some some 23 by 23 matrices with entries in z mod 17 and determinant one and you identify the matrix with its negative with negative the matrix um so so there's some infinite families so there's some un well understood a uh, finite list finite list finite list of infinite families it, this is all happening. A lot of this is happening uh, uh, thanks to contributions uh, of people here at Rutgers. And there are the so-called sporadic. There's a finite list of sporadic uh, finite simple groups, sporadic groups. This is a finite list. Uh, what is there? 26 of them or something. There's like 26. We now know that there are 26 of these groups. And the largest sporadic group this was a huge thing. People were were really, you know, it, it involves the leech lattice, by the way, or at least Conway's construction does. Uh, is called is called the monster. The monster, which uh, anyway, the, the monster has something like eight times ten to the fifty three elements. Is that right? Something like that. So it's this. It has a nice prime factorization, but it's some it's some huge uh, monstrosity. The monster group. And uh, of course, people want to study this thing, so they start computing its uh, irreducible representations. The way you understand, uh, we we've talked about this: how representation theory, representation theory. Maybe I should have said this before. You can think of representation theory as like if you want to study uh, surfaces, you can look at the tangent space to every point in a surface, right? If you want to look at surfaces, here's some surface. Okay, I look at a point and I look at the tangent plane. So this is like the linearization. So if I understand the tangent plane everywhere, I can learn about the surface by knowing all of the tangent planes and putting them back together, I'll, I'll get the surface. So a tangent plane, uh, tangent space to a manifold, to a manifold tells you a lot about the, the manifold. In fact, the whole tangent bundle, the whole bundle of tangent spaces, okay? In the same way, knowing all of the irreducible representations, irreducible representations are like, tangent spaces are like linearization. This is like local linearization linearization of the manifold. And the same way, irreducible representations or representations in general of a group, of a, uh, a group are in the same way linearizations of, of that group. So anyway, so people start uh, understanding. So what are the irreducible representations, irreducible representations of the monster? Uh, and in particular, what are their dimensions? So the first dimension is one. The next dimension is one because the trivial representation is always there. Uh, the next dimension is one nine six eight eight three. Oh come on, that's a pure coincidence. There's no way that this is like these numbers have nothing to do with each other. The next dimension is two one two. It's almost a New York phone number nine six eight. Seven six. I don't know how your how fast your arithmetic is. What is this number plus this number plus that number? Is that number? Those have different numbers of digits as written. Uh, this is twenty million. Ha. Huh. Yeah, well, maybe I copied wrong. I got you. I'll find it. Thanks. <laughs> Obviously, I'm not computing these on, on the fly. 
okay, and so on. So, so this became known as moonshine. M McKay sort of observed this, and then Conway and, and lots of other people. Uh, so John Conway called this moonshine because there's no, you know, like how drunk do you have to be to, to think that there's going to be some relation between the irreducible, the dimensions of irreducible representations, the largest sporadic simple group, and the coefficients of this J invariant that comes from parametrizing elliptic curves. Like there's no way these things have anything to do with one another. What did I get wrong? So your J invariant, it's 214-937-60. Six, zero, thank you. There we go. So now we're in the 20 millions. I guess we could have done it by adding these three together. Yeah. That, that fact that <laughs> I do. But we didn't know which one was wrong. At least I didn't. Right, we don't know which one was wrong. Yeah, okay. Anyway, <laughs> so let's see. Six plus three plus one is zero. So mod 10, we got it right. <laughs> um, one digit at a time. Okay. So, uh, so this, so you know, how in the world uh, are these two things connected? It turns out, after a, after a lot of work in the in the eighties, people realized that this group connected due to something called um, uh, vertex algebras. So, um, uh, vertex operator algebras, vertex operator algebras, and so lots of people, including our own Jim Lepowski sort of explained why, if you understood enough about these vertex operator algebras, you would be able to prove this conjecture. In fact, Richard Borchards did eventually. Borchards was Conway's student. Borchards uh, proved the relationship, proved uh, rigorously that these dimensions are indeed arising there for a reason. And this was the reason. And he got the Fields Medal in 98, I think, for, for, uh, for this work. Okay, so another crazy, you know, what do finite simple groups have to do with modular forms? A lot. At so first, it doesn't look like anything. At first, it was just like, oh, I recognize these numbers. Yeah, the first one is like, oh, come on. <laughs> this, is, this is purely an accident. There's no way this is anything to do with it. By the way, <laughs> yeah. So Ramanujan really liked this thing. I mean, we're, we're jumping around. This is, this is now 1990s, 1980s and 90s, and, and this was in the 70s. Uh, the J invariant is like late 19th century. Um, but Ramanujan really loved this. So another aside, Ramanujan loved this thing because it turns out that when you take the J function, remember it's a function of Z. Z is in the upper half plane. Z is in the upper half plane. And um, people had worked out enough of the theory of complex multiplication to know that when you take J of one plus root 163i over two, which is something called a CM point that has to do with complex multiplication. 163 is the, is the largest discriminant having class number one, largest discriminant imaginary quadratic field having class number one. So if you evaluate G at this point, J at this point, you get an integer. That integer is very, uh, this one I think, I don't have to look up. It's 640032 cubed with a minus sign. Okay. So, so let's let's think about that. So Ramanujan knows that J of one plus uh, root one sixty three i over two is um, is this number I said six four zero three two zero cubed with a with a it's a negative integer. The point is it's an integer, and um, and so let's think about what that means. Remember the J function is Q inverse. This is a this is a z. Q is e to the two pi i z. So it's Q inverse plus seven forty four. Uh, plus some huge number times Q and then other terms. Okay, so what is Q? Q is e to the two pi i z. Z is this number. So this is e to the two pi i times one half plus uh, i times root 163 over two. Well, the twos cancel. Pi i, e to the pi i is negative one. And uh, pi i squared is e to the negative pi root 163. Okay, that's what q is. If I put that in here, this first number q inverse is negative q to the power pi times square root of 163. Then I get this number 444, uh, 744. And then I get something that has that's multiplied by e to the minus pi root 163. 
and then even smaller numbers. And that's equal to this, this number. So what Ramanujan loved, if you unwind this, what it says is that e, this implies that e to the pi times root 163 is equal to, so let's look at it in Mathematica, e to the pi times square root of 163. Well, yes, that's what it is. Give me the, give me the numerical. Oh, come on, give me more digits. Give me like 20 digits. Okay. Uh, so this is times 10 to the 17. So the decimal place is about here. This is the decimal place. 744 is the decimal place. Let's get 30 decimals. Yeah. So it's 7, 744 is here. We have uh, 10 nines so far. Let's get 50 decimal places. So it's a string of 12 nines before more things. So this number is almost an integer. It's this huge, huge number. And it's off by this tiny amount from being an integer. The tiny amount, if I take off this 744, is 640320 cubed. 262537412640768, and then 000 with a 744 added on top. So this is this number, which uh, 640320 cubed plus 744 plus something of order 10 to the minus 12. Um, all right, we have, we have one more minute. Let me just go back to this, uh, this discriminant function. Maybe I can say everything here. So Ramanujan also was very fond of this thing. And uh, he multiplied this out. And if you multiply out this series, you know, raising everything to the 24th power, you need the binomial theorem to open this up. You get Q, because um, Q, everything's being multiplied by Q. And then you get, um, minus 24 q squared and then plus 252 q cubed and then minus 1472 again i might be misreading these numbers uh plus 48 30 q to the fifth and minus this is the only one i want to see 6048 q to the sixth and so on okay so so you multiply this thing out this is called the tau function the Ramanujan tau function. The code, these, these, the sequence one negative twenty four two fifty two, is the uh, the tau, the so called Ramanujan tau function. And Ramanujan noticed a, a couple of things. Let me, uh, maybe I'll just say them in words. He noticed that twenty four times two fifty two, negative twenty four times two fifty two is so the coefficient of q squared times the coefficient of q cubed is the coefficient of, of q to the sixth. So he noticed that tau of m times n is equal to tau of m times tau of n when m and n are co-prime. He conjectured this. He didn't know how to prove it. Mordell proved it using HECA operators. Uh, this is 1917, 1917, and Mordell proved this fact. And Mordell uh, developed what became later known as HECA operators uh, proved this fact. Ramanujan also noticed that the prime values of p are never more than two times p to the 11 halves, which is another crazy thing. This comes from the fact that this is a weight one, weight 12 modular form. So this product itself was a weight one half before we raised it to the 24th power. Um, and this was uh, an open conjecture known as the Ramanujan conjecture. And this was finally proved in the 70s by Dwayne, for which he got the Fields Medal. So uh, using the Vey conjectures, using growth index, uh, uh, work. So anyway, the point is modular forms are all over the place and um, and we're going to come back after spring break and, and talk about them from a completely different point of view as irreducible representations in the decomposition of the action of SL2R on the quotient or SL2 of the Adele's. <laughs>